Uh, you got to unbiased what you thought and what you've been maybe exposed to every and single what day. what you paid a lot of money for. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, See those guys over there? Yeah. yeah. So they're, kind of, they're kind of worthless. Yeah. Well, so can no, you... They're not worthless, but you know what I mean. Right. I understand. So actually, can you... Because that, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Uh, I didn't go to physical therapy school, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so I want to know what you learn in physical therapy school. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into the postural restoration world, how that transition happens mm -hmm. and, or first of all, what led you into, to actually let's start with physical therapy school. Okay. What is physical therapy school like? Yeah. Um, so that was over a decade ago, but I remember thinking when starting, is I thought related directly to sports and improving your performance in sports. And physical therapy is super broad. I mean, you have, you know, you go into home health. So somebody who might be um, recovering from a knee surgery or knee replacement, then you've got people that are working with pediatrics, kids with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. uh, and back in the day they used to do, and it's kind of, well, one wound care. So that was a big thing that's slowly, slowly being taken. I don't know about being taken away from PTs, but maybe they have, another um, profession that's doing more of it, but uh, percussion of lungs, that used to be a thing. That was on our boards. Oh, really? So, yeah, you had to learn. And so it was part of like cardiopulmonary. Yeah. And so you have all these, you know, PT school to me is systemic. So it's just trying to cover this very broad. Okay. And, yeah. and I don't think that I'd get in trouble for saying this, but I don't even really look at postural restoration as physical therapy. Like to me, they don't necessarily, um, I don't want to say that they're not synonyms, but it just happens to be that Ron is a licensed PT. Right. And that's how okay. I, that's, that's how I say it. Like, and I don't think you're going to get in trouble. I think that's kind of what everyone realizes. And that was one of the things I had to realize again, to get confidence in myself that I just assumed that physical therapists would know, would know more about this than me. Yeah. I realized this is not physical therapy. Not at all. It's its own discipline. And I've said it should be a two-year college degree. Yeah. <laughs> really yeah. understand all this. Yeah. But that's something you're going to learn easily through continuing education until right. you have a lot of time to do it. Uh, because it's a, it's, you, it takes time. So um, in PT school, the, you, know, you have your cadaver lab. In my first year, if you made an A, you could actually be hired as a second year to be the lab assistant. Right. And so um, I was just fascinated by the cadavers. And I mean, most people thought, you know, it is a little gruesome. We had a few people pass out. You have those stories. But oh. I wish I could go back and have that same opportunity now as right. a possible restoration therapist. And I've been going to every single cadaver trying to look at all the internal asymmetries yeah. that not once were ever discussed in our anatomy right. lab, ever discussed. Uh -uh. I mean, the only thing I knew about the diaphragm, and I'm not kidding when I say this, is C4, C5 keeps you alive. I mean, you learn like the nerve root of the innervation and the yeah. phrenic nerve of the diaphragm. Okay. So they never were like, okay, look at, did we, even with the lungs, they didn't mention like, hey, look at the difference between the lungs and it wasn't. No, not, not really. It's all, you all learn it medical based, not, not as a. Well, as what a does that function. mean? Medical based. What does the diaphragm do? What do the lungs do? You know, uh, volume of, I mean, you're not, you're not really um, learning any function related to movement, which is kind of funny about the diaphragm. Okay. So it is conceivable when you talk about this stuff with doctors, they will have no clue what you're talking about. A hundred percent. I think so. I'm, I'm not saying that on all across the board. Right. Right. But it wouldn't be surprising if the doctor was like, what are you talking about with this asymmetry thing? Yes. Could they possibly, if they were a surgeon and they cut into bodies, I mean, I've never seen a diaphragm, plural, mm -hmm. uh, live, but I've seen pictures. And I, mm -hmm. at Body World's exhibit in Manhattan in the Discovery mm -hmm. Channel store or Discovery Channel Museum, whatever it's, they call it, when I saw the difference between the right side and the left side of the diaphragm, plural, of the diaphragms, yeah. I had to take, it said no pictures allowed. And I just whipped out my phone and I was like. <laughs> and, this is worth going to jail for. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's what I always tell people. And I have seen that picture floating around the internet. It's been stolen 
by people on Instagram. I just want to point that out. Shocking, uh, shocking. Yeah. <laughs> so my picture has been stolen. What I risked my freedom for has been stolen, but <laughs> not attributed. But when I saw the difference in the size, it was astounding. It was a top down mm -hmm. uh, picture. Right. So not like in the textbooks where it's, I think it is usually drawn asymmetrical, mm -hmm. asymmetrically drawn, but I don't think it gives you the full appreciation for the amount of asymmetry that I see in that picture that I took. Right. Because from the top, looking down into the thoracic cavity, uh, it's not even remotely close. Right. Yeah. It's, it's how, and then, then, then people look at that picture and they're like, holy crap, like, why did no one ever think about this? It's so, they can see it. It's not like a minor, like, I think that eye might be a little bit higher than the other eye, like with facial asymmetries. Like, right. it's so obvious. So right. it's amazing to me that no one ever, even in physical therapy school, never, no one ever said, hey, look at the difference. Question that. Yeah. Well, I even think like in my office, you can kind of see, but I have a netter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a picture of the diaphragm like that I pull out for my teaching. Yeah. And I look at the, um, I think that's netter. Yeah. So that dates back to the seventies and you look at the internal cavity and it's very different. And I'm like, what? why didn't I ever say anything? Like you just kind of, it's just yeah. interesting, I guess. It, yeah. And I'm not saying that no one's talked about, it. I have no idea. This is only, you know, my experience at the university of Texas, you know? Right. So, okay. Much, but yeah. So, all right. So when you're in physical therapy school, do you, do you at any point, choose like a direction in which to go and then you do more coursework on that? Right. No, you don't because okay. physical therapy school has to prepare you for the licensing licensure board, which is 250 questions, right? And it's okay. federal. So I mean, it's everybody takes the same test and you have to show competency in every single okay. part. But okay. here's the funny part in our neuro, you know, we talked about PNF, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, neuro was a pretty big, I had to take an eight week rotation. Um, I didn't yeah, people, yeah, people might not under, actually understand what neuro means. So if you could just. Okay. So you're dealing with people that may have had strokes or you could be dealing with people that were um, even amputees okay. or prosthesis or um, child development that, that, um, you know, cerebral palsy. It's so I, I get what you mean. Yeah. Neuro meaning it's not like a straight sports or my back hurts. It's okay. a, there's more complicated going on, right? Okay. And I hated neuro, or I thought I did, because yeah. I wanted to save the world one athlete at a time. <laughs> and I'm like, and I look back, and um, I'm sitting here, and Dorothy Voss is part of PNF, you know, way to learn about her. And I remember that eight week rotation, and I didn't specifically love my um, my clinical instructor, mm -hmm. so that could have been part of that experience. But I, you know, I liked the. Um, it was an inpatient hospital. So you're helping people in that in-between go home. So from strokes, they might've had a stroke for 14 days ago and you're going to see them for 30. And um, it was rewarding, but I didn't enjoy learning about it. And I can't wrap my head around why that is because now all I do is see neuro and think neuro. Right. I'm like, oh, that's a big joke on me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe my life would have been different had I liked it early on in PT school, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't know. So so looking back now, uh, do you see things in the population that you're working with? Do you see neuro like, I mean, we all know it's neuro, but like neuro like symptoms, things that you would have seen with someone in PT school that was labeled a neuro person, but you see similar manifestations in the general population that no one would say is neuro. They're still thinking, oh, this person has a a bum knee yeah or uh you know whatever it's going to be you know what i mean yes so are you you know what's that connection because i know you know ron would always say oh, i see these types of people all the time like they're they're pre whatever yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you see these types of people all the time and they're they're they have symptoms that you would have seen in these neuro cases yes or you know behaviors let's say Mm -hmm. So can you make that connection, like how there's a little bit of these neuro patients in everybody? Yes, a hundred percent. I saw a, a stroke 12 year old soccer player yesterday. Okay. You know, you're like, man, you have zero idea how to use your left side. 
Yes. So, you know, so to explain, this child did not have a stroke. <laughs> right. Totally fine. The similar inability to do things that you find in a stroke patient, you're finding in this child. Yeah. Okay. So like no awareness. I mean, I literally had to take her shoe off, put her in long sitting, which is where your legs are out straight, slight bend, and put my hand underneath her heel to get her to dig her heel, just like you would do with a stroke patient. Mm. You, you do a lot more tactile cueing when you're working so that they can actually you can feel how much effort they're giving you. Okay. And so they can actually turn on muscles. And she's sitting there and she's like, uh, I don't feel my hamstring. I'm like, you don't feel your hamstring. My arm's dying. And it took us three sets before she actually felt her hamstring. This girl is playing um, on a select team, but also playing with boys that are 14 and 16 year old three days a week. She's not a little sissy of a soccer player. Yeah. And that's why she came to see me because they're trying to get her back pain-free as soon as, you know, as soon as possible. Mm. And um, anyway, when, when you show somebody those powerful things and we associate stroke with, you know, an arm that doesn't swing maybe, or you can't lift a leg or your, your even your face or droopy, or they can't, you know, you can have a stroke that affects your speech. Mm. Well, there's plenty of people that can't speak and use their tongue correctly, but have never been diagnosed with a stroke, you know? Right, right. And we actually were just or talking about this. We were talking about this last week about people that speak out of the side of their mouth. Yes. And what's going on with that. Right. And I used to see it and I'm like, why does that person speak out of the side of their mouth? Mm -hmm. uh, and would you attribute it to, not a stroke patient, but someone with this, they're talking out of the side of their mouth with a pattern that resembles a neurological function that's resembling something that goes on with a stroke patient, mm -hmm. but which is clearly reversible. Yes. Because it's a pattern. Yes, and there's no actual damage like in a stroke patient right. to the vessels. It's it's a lateralization of your brain that okay. we're so born explain, with. What, is, what does that mean? Because I don't even think I've ever talked about lateralization of the brain on my YouTube channel. I've intimated, yeah. I've hinted at it, but I don't think yeah. I've actually said it like that. So just can yeah. you just go into that lateralization of the brain and, and what it really means? Yeah, so when we're, when we're born, our left brain is born with more neuromotor points for our right side, period. So that's why 90% of the population is right-handed because of the way the brain organizes the information. You have some left-handed, which is about 10% of the population, and we call those special people. <laughs> They're difficult to work with because the way they organize, because they can use both. Yeah. You know, and Ron made, uh, I don't remember what course this was in with him, but he said, our right-handed people, we really need to be using the left and the right is assisting the left to improve better function in right. life. Not just, I don't mean just handedness to catch a ball, right? but make you not be one-sided all the time. Right. So, and so, yeah. And so people who are already using their left arm, mm -hmm. because they're left-handed, mm -hmm. sometimes a lot of people will say lefties are harder to work with. Mm-hmm. And can you explain why that is? Yeah, well, the way they organize their information in their brain is different than the way you're a right-handed person, correct? So- Well, they well, well yes. <laughs> However, in the eighth grade, I realized that I could bat lefty and be a lot better. And I- Oh, because of your eye. Well, we, that's, the, that's the great mystery. Uh, all I know is that yeah. my ability to bat right-handed decreased over mm -hmm. time through Little League. And then to the point that I could uh -huh. literally, I sucked for lack of a better word. I could not hit. And <laughs> so in, in a fit of rage in eighth grade, I was taking batting practice and I just sucked again. And I just switched <laughs> to lefty and I could not miss the ball. I, it was so awkward and I didn't have power, but I couldn't miss. And people just stopped and watched. And yeah. it was, my friend will still remember that day. And I had no, now it's starting to make sense in my life. So I had the ability, so I could do some lefts. I don't even know if that would be considered left, like cross dominant or whatever. All yeah. I know is that I was a much better hitty, hitter lefty than I was righty. And again, yeah. was it simply because of the vision? I don't know. Did it, was it a, a, this cross functional patterning of cortical dominance? I don't know. Right. But, yeah, so I'm not strictly a right-handed person. Yes, yeah. Well, and that comes the cortical dominance too, which you were talking about. That's a that's a pretty to me a high-level term to get that we have a preference that we were born with a bias. And it's just kind of hard to wrap your head around, you know yeah. why. <laughs> but Ron has this really cool picture in um, 
I don't think it's the cranial course, but it actually shows looking down on the brain. The brain is not, it's just like the, di you know, not just like the diaphragm, but the brain is not perfectly yeah. um, symmetrical. Right. One lobe is slightly in front and one lobe is slightly in yeah, back. Yeah, that's, that's, I know where that's from. He took that from the, the book, The Master and His Emissary. Yes. And it's the Yaklovian twist or something. Yes. He was looking from the bottom up. I think that was the... Uh-huh. I'm not sure if they were looking down or up. But at any rate, yeah, they're not they're not symmetrically positioned. There's like a twist already going on in the position of the brain. Correct. Yeah. So but yeah, we're we're still striving in life to get this symmetry when we treat. And it's like, I don't know if you'll ever get there. <laughs> Which will never exist, right? Yeah. Right. So so symmetry, asymmetry is not the issue. Correct. It it is a it is when that normal asymmetry goes <laughs> abnormal. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, so that pendulum, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we have the pendulum. I always say, if you want to talk about our pattern, here's your neutral spot and you got, let's, we'll go left AIC because you use, you've used that a lot on your YouTube channel. So as we swing to one side and then we start becoming really heavy patterned, we don't know how to come back over here. We don't ever want to live necessarily in one or the other. We want to try as much as we can to stay in the neutral, in the neutral zone. But mm -hmm. what I always tell my clients or anybody that I'm mentoring is we cannot expect as humans to ever, so I'm going to use my right hand and my left hand. It doesn't matter how many times I write with my left, I'm a right-handed person or grasp objects with my left hand. They will never be sensed in my brain the same as this. Right. Never, never, even on the feet, you know, because I have, a, I treat a lot of soccer players. Well, I want them to be left footed and right footed. And I'm like, that's fine. And that'd be probably better that they're not kicking with one leg all the time, mm -hmm. but it'll never be the same on either side of the body. So as long as we can remember that and we can both appreciate it, then we can keep moving here, you know?